Hello there. Hi. What's <laughs> up? <laughs> surprise. Surprise. I was really surprised, but you know what? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of the HGC Eastern Clash Qualifiers for Southeast Asia. And we'll be our casters for today. I am Riku. Joining me at the desk is Jay Howe. How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm good. Just, I was ready to start. I was like, I... Oh, yeah. Like, I saw... <laughs> you know, it, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> you know, it catches you off guard sometimes. We're it ready does, to go, though. Day number two, though, here. Super uh, hype. Super hype. Not a surprise who has been the favorites, though. Yeah, I mean, Deadly Kittens is still on a six-win streak, and we've seen a couple of matches that were quite close, but not so much during the last few minutes of the game. I mean, we've got a few favorites as well, um, Resurgence and Meow Pork, but we've got a few new teams with veteran players like Sirius, Play Stomp, but you know what? Let's check out what happened yesterday uh, based on the brackets. Yeah, yesterday's bracket, obviously, we're going to see exactly how this played out. You talked about some of the new blood and some of the old blood that's going to be here as well. As we saw Deadly Kittens basically 2-0 their way all the way through the top part of the bracket. And then Meow Pork, who was looking really strong, ended up falling in that winner's bracket finals, moving down to the bottom. They're waiting, though, to see how this bottom part of the bracket plays out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for Team Sirius, they have faced Deadly Kittens at the first few, uh, the first games during the first day, and uh, they didn't do quite well. But now they're going to be facing Mikhailson for our first game of day two. Yeah, you know, obviously we've got the double elimination bracket, so we're going to see who can play their way in. And again, with the double elimination bracket, if we do make it to the grand finals and the winner of the loser's bracket comes in and wins in the grand finals, we'd have the rubber match. So we've got that. And I tell you what, like I said, I've said it all weekend. Two times I've been here this year. This is the third time. And each of the first two times we went to the grand finals, the loser bracket winner comes in takes the first series, and then the winner bracket's like, wait a minute, no, we, we got here for a reason. <laughs> they come back, and, and they do that. So we'll see how it plays out throughout the day. But this region, always exciting with uh, the second day going into the finals. Exactly. I was about to bring that uh, point up, how if this is going to be the same thing over and over again with you know proceeding to the next few rounds, or will Deadly Kittens finish this with, I don't know, a 2-0, adding to an 8-win streak, representing at the, uh, representing Southeast Asia at the Eastern Clash. Yeah, and we talk about that, and it was really interesting because I was watching the North American HGC while I was eating my breakfast this morning, <laughs> getting ready. You know, I mean, obviously time zone different here. It's 8 p.m. there. It's like it was 7.30 p.m. there, and I'm eating breakfast, right? And I hear them, and, you know, I get to listen to Gilly. We'd start talking about, uh, you know, Deadly Kittens and how much noise they made at the midseason brawl. Dreadnought as well. You know, there was a lot of really good feedback around this team, and there's a lot of promise, too. They stuck together. They realized, you know, that beforehand they, they had split during the early part of the year and then they came back together and they had a pretty decent show. And I think obviously, you know, for one of the smaller regions, you know, expectations aren't as high, but I think the, the name that they made for themselves and the confidence that they have, you know, we expect them to. But again, what we saw out of Meow Pork yesterday, you can definitely expect them to come back, try and fight for that spot and end up there. But at the same time, you talked about resurgence. And then we saw Play Stop with moments that they had shown and if they just kind of bring it all together, they might be a dark horse, kind of surprising people. You know, so there's a lot, I think, that can happen here in the SEA region here in day number two. Exactly. There is a lot of team history. When you mentioned Play Stomp, it recurred to me how some of the members were actually ex-teammates of some of, the, some of the players from Deadly Kittens. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, sort of rivalry go going on based on the player roster. So I'm really excited who's going to end up at our grand finale. But you know what? We're going to be heading to our first game later on. That is between Sirius Gaming versus Mikhailson, which did not appear on the stream. So this is going to be our first time seeing Mikhailson. But Sirius, we've already seen them, um, you know, strut their stuff against Deadly Kittens yesterday. Yeah, and w it, because we didn't get to see them, and it was during the early part of the bracket, it's really hard to gauge w where they are in terms of how good they are, how how much they might need to improve. You know, I think yeah. that's one of the things is we're going to find out here. You know, we saw Sirius yesterday. You know, they had a tough series, but at the same time, McKelson obviously going to be a new name, new face for us to take a look at today, and that's, that's something I'm looking forward to. Again, you always want to try and analyze the talent, see what type of talent the region brings, things like that, and kind of look ahead in the future, even if they don't do well here, what type of problem do they have there's a lot of people that make names for themselves i remember when i was here last time you know there are certain players that just 
kept standing out individually, individually, and you wonder maybe they get their break somewhere else, maybe other teams form, maybe there's a, a roster swap at some point. But there's a lot of good individual talent within different regions. It's always fun to take a look at all the teams across and see the entire spectrum of how teams perform and players perform. So that's something I'm looking forward to today uh, personally uh, going into this first series. Yep, same here. Because uh, looking at the rosters coming from Serious Gaming, you did mention how there are a lot of new team names we aren't familiar with but when you look at the roster there are very uh, familiar names like you know fiery boy fiery boy from serious gaming and from mikhailson i believe ice frog was also uh at the at the tournament last split during the uh during april i believe plus niklaus uh, version 5 as well so a lot of familiar players i'm pretty sure some of their fans would definitely look forward to this match I think everybody's looking forward to it as well. But, you know, there's going to be a lot that plays out today. You know, when for at least five series, we're going to have the potential rubber match again. So, you know, we've got a lot of action going on today. Obviously, starting in the lower bracket, we'll move our way along. And the grand finals, of course, is always – I'm telling you, every time I'm here, there's always something tricky that comes in the grand finals. I remember even back in February, you know, there was a bunch of cheese strats coming around there. It was just a matter of – but it's kind of hard to call them cheese when they're winning, yeah. right? And so I remember we had a call afterwards. This was when Resurgence had won. And they're like, well, they cheesed us, so we decided we were just going to cheese them back. And that, that's kind of how they came back. So there's always different things that play out on the second day. We've also seen the changes. We're on the live patch today. Yes. So, you know, we had a new Brack changes, which we saw yesterday. Somebody felt the need to go Locust Horn because they could feel how less survivable than a new Brack was in those moments. You know, we saw an early Zool game. It didn't work out well. You know, we saw some Cho'Gall. We've seen a little bit of everything. But, again, with the current meta, the way things are are coming out you know we've got the drafts now teams have been able to go back and watch see what other teams are picking things that they might prioritize and you know we saw deadly kittens with some target bans against Meowpork when they banned out a, a second band Rhaegar because they knew they were going to be coming into the double support things like that start to spring up so if you look at your opponent's drafts you look at that you can start to develop strategies into day two so I want to see who's done their homework who's recognizing draft patterns and things like that and see if they can find ways to manipulate it. it's not just about like hey are we good yeah. that, that obviously has a big factor Actor, but it's also understanding your opponent's strengths and weaknesses and understanding yours and finding ways to counter that. So there's a lot of things that always shake out when we talk about these double elimination tournaments because you have the second chance to get another view of your opponent. You get to see what they've done otherwhere, other, otherwise, and then you just try and find ways to counter it. So there's a lot that goes into this double elimination. Yeah, so for serious gaming, with what you said, they've certainly learned a lot facing Deadly Kinser during the first phase of our day one. So with this, Serious Gaming versus Mikhailson, um, looking at the draft, uh, Serious Gaming um, has played Malthale. So that's pretty interesting since, you know, he's quite um, tricky to use as well as, you know, Zul, you mentioned. They're the ones that brought it up, but... They, they, they were the ones so that well. played Zul in yep, game one and Cho'Gall in game two. Yep, they're the guys. <laughs> but you feel bad, right? Because they tried it against Deadly Kittens. And maybe they were just trying to, again, sometimes when you go up against somebody that you know is going to be better in terms of just all-around talent, you know yes. that they're a good team. you got to find ways to mix it up. Make them uncomfortable. Because if not, if you just take your best versus their best and you know that you're not as good, you're going to be the uncomfortable ones. So you find ways to just kind of make things different, play around a little bit, and just try and make them uncomfortable with the draft. Force them to respond to you and see if there were ways. Obviously, Sirius had a little bit of a difficult time, as Deadly Kittens is kind of difficult to throw off yeah, in that manner. Definitely. Uh, but they definitely attempted that. So we'll see again. We saw Sirius very first part of yesterday, and then they had the entire rest of the day to watch what happened. So we'll see yeah. uh, what they picked up from yesterday. Exactly, because uh, the streamed games, Deadly Kittens were there thrice they fought three matches and the closest match that we've seen so far to deadly kittens was the meow pork one correct and the first game from play stomp which we thought that would have been you know that really prolonged game except that one moment that they got a little bit too greedy and then it just turned 180 degrees that's the thing is that sometimes it's the smallest moments you know i i called it i was like i see this happening Please don't let it happen. <laughs> it's like you're watching it in slow motion. You're just like, please don't. No, just just back away. And they didn't. And it came back to bite them. And again, it's it's moments like that. You can have a chance to go back and watch your games, analyze the things that you did good and things that you didn't do so well. And so you can take those moments and understand that they had a two-level lead. And now all of a sudden you come back. It's like, how do we improve on those moments? And I think that that's can be said for all teams is you can't just look at what went well. You got to sometimes look at what didn't go well. And so, again, we'll see how these teams come into today and approach today. You can definitely – it's always interesting that 
you can tell the teams that did their homework, and then you can tell the teams that didn't do their homework. Yeah. It's like, all right, are you still just banning because you don't like those heroes, or are you actually banning because you know that the other team likes those heroes? Yeah. And they do well, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on uh, today as we, we move forward. Exactly, because for Team Sirius and Mikhailson, looks like our first map is going to be at Tomb of the Spider Queen. Any sort of priority picks that they could take off from the draft? Well, you know, it was, you know, when we get there, obviously, we see a lot of stitches nowadays, and the whole stitch is Kalthas, and it's a matter of, can teams pull it off? You know, do you have the execution? And it, it's one of those things that, in theory, it seems pretty easy. Like, all right, I've seen them run it. I know how this works. I press hook. I, I throw my hook out as stitches. And then you're going to press E as Kael Thas. And it seems pretty easy. You press two yeah. buttons. But it's a matter, it's, it's f so much deeper than that. We're talking about 16 second cooldown on a hook. So now all of a sudden you have to communicate when this is available. Kael Thas has to be a little bit more, you know, reserved when he's using the gravity laps making sure that that's available when that's available so communication comes in getting in sync making sure not just one and two people are together but everybody's together and that's the thing is that we see a lot of these teams they try these compositions that in theory they are pretty easy to run until you try it and it's not just a matter of do we get it once you have to get it repeatedly throughout a game because that is your strength that is your win condition and so you have to find ways to get those picks. And if you don't practice this, if it isn't something you're familiar with, the minute you get into a game, the pressure's on, all of a sudden communication's a little bit more tense, things like that. And we see teams that aren't as well tested in that and that they want to try it. It looks good when it lands, yeah. but if it's not consistent, you're going to have a really hard time. And again, things like that always sound good. They always seem easy, but they're not always as easy as they look. Yeah, but one thing I noticed about the Southeast Asian region is that they really like to team fight a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they love to team fight. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, because um, some of the drafts that they have formed sometimes are sort of like balanced, that they can split push sometimes, they can macro the, their way in. But for some reason, they just really, really like to fight a lot. And then after that, they transition it into objectives. And it's just understandable because I really love the action. I understand. But, you know, um, it's something probably some of the te lower teams could, you know, try to experiment on, perhaps. It, it's interesting because a team like PlayStomp we saw yesterday felt the need that they were just going to team fight the whole time and hope that something comes afterwards. And it wasn't always there. And then when the team fight went bad, they, they didn't know the options to come back. True. except for to go fight another fight team again. fight. Yeah. And it wasn't always on even talent tiers. It always wasn't at the optimal moment. But it was like, well, this is what we know. This is what we know best. And we're going to see if it works. And at times it did. It they, did. Even, they even had a seven and a half minute game on Cursed Hollow. A seven and a half minute game. Very few teams actually say that. It's just one of those things you're like, seven and a half minutes on Cursed Hollow. Really? Oh, yeah. That was a time that... The opposite team that was losing, that lost the curse, was actually aiming for the boss. Half HP. They spotted it out. They no one checked away. the crush. They gave it away. <laughs> and then seven-minute game. Seven-minute game. But then they turned around, and then they crumbled when it came time to a longer, more macro-focused game. And that's the difference is that at that time in the second game, they're like, well, it worked for us in game number one, so we're going to just continue to do the same thing. And it doesn't just work that way. And so I think in SEA... There's a handful of teams that really try and excel at just everything. Deadly yes. Kittens, obviously, at the top of that heap. And it was something sure. that I talked about, you know, when we were at the last uh, qualifier in April when they had reformed, is that it's not just necessarily making the right call. It's the zero hesitation which, with which they make it. And it's one of the reasons why I like watching that team from this region is that they recognize their options. They recognize a lot of times the best possible thing you can do. The minute you get that one pick, they instantly, all five, are on the same page making making that move. So that's the things that you look for in top tier teams that other teams on the smaller end should strive for is how can you, the minute you get that pick, the minute you get that team fight win, how do you instantly move to that next step and control the next two or three minutes and give yourself the advantages the rest of the way? Resurgence is kind of up there. Deadly Kittens at the top. Meow Pork, obviously I thought they had a lot of really good recognition yeah. until they got greedy yesterday. Uh, so it's teams like that that you really try and look towards uh, to try and take that next step that it's not just about, for a lot of teams, They'd be perfectly content with getting out of this qualifier and making it to Eastern Clash in Taiwan. Sounds amazing, looks yeah. amazing, you get some good money, you know. <laughs> so things like that are always good. But with a team like Deadly Kittens, they don't want to just win this. They want to make sure that they win this, but they have aspirations to be better at Eastern Clash. And that's the thing that I admire the most about them is that they don't want to just be good enough for their region. They want to be able to take series off some of the top tier teams in the in the Eastern 
region. And that's one thing that I look forward to is what team is satisfied with trying to, to do well here and what yeah. team is looking for more? Yeah, because um, just as Babel mentioned, they're the only ones that didn't change their rosters in comparison to the rest of the teams, especially the experienced or the seasoned teams already for Southeast Asia. Plus, the, the one thing that I noticed during the... Uh, during the these past few matches, in comparison to the uh, the experienced teams versus you know the the teams that are have just newly formed, is that they hesitate a lot. For some reason, when you see these experienced players, when they go, they just go. For them, it's like hesitation. They you it's actually understandable because you know how experienced they are, and so you have to think twice whether you know it's if they're going to be 100% committed to a fight or not. But then if you hesitate too much, then they're, then they're just going to take advantage of that and just make plays of their own, which is quite common where they just play with the music of what their opponent is trying to do all over the map. You see a lot of rotations just following them all over, but not exactly doing much on the map. Well, speaking of not doing much, I think we're ready to get into the game. We've had enough talking. It's time to start day number two as Mikhailson will be taking on Team Sirius, Tomb of the Spider Queen, to start things off here, Riku. Woo, super hyped about this first game of our day number two. And we noticed how we already brought up how Sirius was the one who faced off Deadly Kittens earlier uh, on day number one with bringing up the new Zool and then bringing up the Cholgul Ariel. So that was pretty interesting. Well then. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> we have a quick bug, a quick disconnect. We're going to get right back into the game. I was just trying to refresh there as yeah. uh, we got started. But um, I think we're good to go. Yep. I think we're good to go. I I'm just kind of keeping, keeping an eye on it over here to make sure that we're ready to go back in. But <laughs> again, it is Tomb of the Spider Queen. I uh, had a quick... Uh, Quick disconnect. We're going to take just a second before we get back into that game. Wait for uh, that to refresh. Re rejoin the lobby. But yeah, we were talking about the uh, the interesting pickups from Sirius Gaming. You can tell that they're the type of team that are mo are the ones that like to go into the meta. Plus, you know, not the not mixing up m mixing it up with their own, perhaps. Style? What do you it's think? After yesterday, right? They ran Zul on Tomb, which old school. That's one of it was used to be one of Zul's best maps. But I feel when it comes to mixing up meta and stuff like that, you have to kind of develop your own. But then you also have to like mix things up. And I'm trying. <laughs> I was trying <laughs> to get that water, obviously. So I'm trying to like really like re re grasp here as we're gonna head back into the draft. Um, but definitely to try and mix things up, I, I think, is is the best way for one of these teams. Uh, again, you need to play to your strengths. That's the, that's the number one thing in this game, no matter what, is play to your strengths and then try and figure out ways to counter. Yes, especially, I mean, we've talked about, we're, we've been talking about Team Sirius, but Mikhailson, this is their time to shine. This is their first time being shown on stream, and I'm pretty interested what kind of draft they're going to be forming for today, as we've already seen two games from Team Sirius, plus they've been against the seasoned Deadly Kittens. So Mikkelsen going to be the first one to ban. They've got a few seconds left for this one. You know, it's actually very understandable that there are a lot of first bans that they could do. Um, we've seen a lot of Anubarak. We've, son we've seen a lot of Oriel, Stitches. Stitches ban, Genji bans. So we'll see what path do they go through. Well, right now, Mikkelsen is looking. They looked briefly at Malthel because yesterday, Sirius first picked Malthel, but understanding that Genji is a really strong hero, uh, they definitely wanted to make sure and take off one of those top tier talents. Exactly. So right now with Team Sirius, um, they have banned yesterday some Illidan and Vala plus... Malthale and Tyriel, but they're going for the Stitches instead, which is quite understandable. Once you land that hook, if you have a follow-up, then it's just easy pick-off. Now, you, you land in an interesting spot here. Uther, we've seen, has stayed at the top, but Anubarak had mixed results yesterday. And again, this is the live patch, so with Anubarak nerfed just a little bit, it, we've seen the lack of survivability, uh, basically what we saw before, is that that health nerf 
was pretty significant. You know, we've seen the change to the Cocoon range. Instead, they're going into Ariel, and I like this a lot. Now, I talked a, bit, a little bit about it yesterday, is that if you're going to run a Cho'Gall comp, you have to have first pick because it gives the other team. You get the two picks before the other team gets their last pick, which gives them less picks to get a counter towards that. But even if you don't go that route, Ariel allows so much flexibility. We are going to see Uther Falstad. Falstad on Tomb of the Spider Queen early is interesting. I imagine we'll see Season Marksman. But if we're going to see a Vala here, I would not be surprised to try and get that Hope Generator. Maybe a Lunara in the back half of the draft and pick something else earlier. That way you can kind of supplement that. And one hero that I haven't seen too much of is Gul'dan. Dahaka, though... Love it as the solo lane. We've seen a lot of teams run this pretty confidently because it's such a strong hero, and they do go the Vala to pair with the Oriole. Uh, for some reason, Mikhailson is really drawing in a really good draft. Solid draft, rather. For Team Sirius, they've got the Falstad. Um, what do you think? Would they be more comfortable with either a Grey main, perhaps? I, if we see a Grey main ban from Mikhailson, I got a feeling we might be seeing a Cho'Gall. The Tassadar is a good ban, but I think that you know we've got to we've got to worry because if you end up going Falstad and Grey mains banned out against you, and then you end up something with like a Tychus or something like that, trying to get that percentage based damage against the Cho'Gall, then you're going to run into a really weird spot because you're running a Falstad Tychus, and it doesn't necessarily scream a lot of team fighting potential. Yes, you have Giant Killer at 13. Yes, you have the Gust to try and force things, but that's not exactly the consistent team fighting that's not exactly the consistent wave clear that we're going to look at mikhailson obviously spending a little bit of time here wow they're setting it up they're setting it up Dreaming right now again I i'm telling you the best way to get that is to make sure that you are first pick and again right here if they lock in another damage dealer okay so zul johanna falstad they really love the zul pick here for team serious that's their second time picking it up from the first day and we'll see. I mean, it could be a Chogol or, you know, the other team went played safe. They had the opportunity to take the Chogol, but instead did not. So we'll see how Mikhailson will select their last two slots for their roster. The thing about the Zul pickup is that now you can't necessarily, if you do end up going against the Chogol, you can't go Mouthale. You know, I'm not saying that Chogol is... 100% likely, but it seems pretty likely because you have the solo leader in Dahaka. The four-man rotation of Ariel, Vala, Chogol in the top two lanes is just phenomenal. They're taking a lot of time here, and they're probably weighing their options on, like, what does Johanna, Zul, and Falstad do to counter this pick? I mean, there's a lot still on the table. And Arthas, I think, would be really good if they're just going to go a more traditional route, but they're locking it in. Maybe they're just trying to build up the suspense. The suspense is near us. They're oh. going to be going for the safe route. Anubarak and Kael'thas instead. Whew. I'm pretty sure they were considering Cho'Gal as they've been really thinking long and hard for this one. Well, that is a solid draft, to say the least. I mean, Kael'thas gives you that burst damage. Vala gives you that sustained damage. And Sylvanas, ultimate wave clear. Sylvanas Zul just dominates wave clear the thing it's tricky right so falstad oh i'd really hope that we see season marksman build especially on this especially against the new brand because you're gonna have a really hard time hitting that back line finding the angles you'll be punished if you go there so season marksman seems more likely you know you can kind of go that route zool kind of flex that in sylvanas so you can kind of flex that control the lanes and it's a little bit tricky and it's it's almost weird to say this because you think all right you have better wave clear on Right side or left side. Yeah. And Zul and Sylvanas is super appealing. Don't get me wrong. Sylvanas really gets that super wave clear at level 7 with Barb Shot. Before that, she normally just kind of locks down the waves, and then you just kind of have to work with her. And I, I don't want to say it's bad, because that sounds weird to say. You don't say <laughs> Sylvanas has bad wave clear. But if you're looking on the other side of a Kael'thas Vala, you, you Q the minion wave, you press W with Kael'thas, you go, and then you just have multi-shot from Vala. That is instantly cleared. Yes. Okay, so Indeed. when you look at that, and what is Sylvanas? Does Sylvanas have instant clear? She doesn't. Falstad doesn't have that instant clear. He doesn't really get that good wave clear until he gets Boomerang at 7. So when you get that, you look at two heroes that don't get that superior wave clear. Where does Zul fit in that? Is Zul going to be in your four man, or is Zul going to be your solo? Is Sylvanas going to be your solo? And then you look at that and the fact that you're going to be going up against a Dahaka. So you don't necessarily own that lane. You control it, but you don't own it. And that's yeah. kind of the weird thing is that you have the double specialist superior wave clear cop <laughs> except you look at it and you're like maybe you don't and that's going to be one of the tricky things that there's got there's subtle things you can do to manipulate that but i'm not 100 percent sold on it well we'll just have to see as we're going to be heading on to our first game of the day 
later on. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> later, on, just just one second. But yeah, it's actually interesting you pointed that out because they have some so, some of their own wave clear for the side of Team Sirius, but I mean for Mikhailson rather. So I'm kind of imagining how Team Sirius might be a little bit banking on you know um, getting the Spider Queens and then just snowballing or getting most out of that and capitalizing and getting a lot of value when they start to push. I, I'm just. The thing that scares me most, Johanna adds to the wave clear. So it's not like you're going to have one person dominate versus the other, as I think we might be off yes. on the microphones yeah, probably, for a second. But we're still going to keep talking, I guess. Be <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're coming through on the headset right now. Yeah, we're not. So I think we're going to fix the audio. Yes, for a while. Yes. There All we right. go. Welcome back. There we go. <laughs> when, you, when you see a guy point to his head... And you can't hear him. You just think he's crazy because he's talking. <laughs> like you just this. see his mouth moving. And you're like, I yeah. think this guy's crazy. <laughs> 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 oh, well. Anyway, back to we were what we were talking about. Oh, right. The wave clear. The JoJo. Yeah, JoJo. Like, again, it's just the thing that worries me. Johanna Falstad, Zul Sylvanas. That team fighting does not impress me at all as we are going to finally head into the game here. And, again, it is game number one, Mikhailson versus Team Sirius. Double specialist. It's not something we see <laughs> that often. That's why I'm really excited. I mean, Team Sirius has been seriously surprising us every time. But you know what? Mikhailson as well, I feel like they've got something up their sleeves as well as this is our first time seeing them in the game. Speaking of something up your sleeves, Kalthas going convection build. And this is not a map I like seeing convection on. It, I mean, obviously you can get the stacks, but Mana Addict on this map in particular, it's easy to finish it. You have infinite mana, especially post-13, when you can just spam abilities as we see the first push up in the top lane. There we go, as they are going to dive in. Nostalgia gets stunned, plus rooted as well, but their target right now is Sky T-Blood. He gets stunned, he gets dragged by the Dahaka, but he got the detainment strike as well to the wall. He's going to be dead soon with the ticks. D.O.T. Johanna. They're spreading fire to each oh other. Oh my god. Uh, Kagami and Skyrar walked in, took the flame strike, walked back out, took that from each other. As we're going to have a quick pause to try and sort out the audio issue. We know you guys uh, definitely want that game sound as much as we do. So we're going to yep. take a quick look at that uh, before we head back into the game. But I hear I hear sound. I hear sound. I, I hear I heard, sound. I heard a click in a menu. Okay. Interesting. But one of the more interesting things was Dahaka used his Brush Stalker to the middle to get vision. It's not something we see early on. And then he went top. And now Dahaka's generally your solo laner, so now he's got to walk all the way to the bottom. And it's a really weird approach, and it was dictated, uh, basically, as we head back into the game here, it was dictated by the side of Team Sirius because they try to put that four man top, and that's what Sylvanas does. Sylvanas can dictate the terms of a fight because of her traits, so we'll see how this plays out. There we go. See the rotation from Team Sirius at the top with Niklaus version 5 joining by Sky, Sky Team Blood on the side of Team Sirius. But with the Vala there as well, they're just really rotating here, responding. Once Team Sirius spots out Mikhailson at the top, they're just going to go right and spread out in different lanes instead. You know, I talked about having that superior wave clear, but when you go convert, there it is. You press, you press D, you press Q, and then you just go in and you instantly clear it. But one of the tricky things is, is when you play Convection Kael'thas, you're always looking to grab those. And this is one of the things I was talking about where Sylvanas can dictate the terms of a fight there. Kogami, in all kinds of trouble, does have the armor, but the gravity lapse is going to get the takedown there. But Sylvanas can dictate the rotations on a fight. The problem is it's Tomb of the Spider Queen, and the rotations don't take very long to get there. So you got to get in and get out. Or that's going to happen. Exactly. The CC lock coming from Mikhailson as well. It's just really scary. The Team Sirius better be quick on their toes and spot out their rotations because look at that. Skyrar might be in trouble and he will be the next one to fall from this one. No escape whatsoever. None whatsoever. And you can see this gank squad. They're willing to give up a little bit of push in the other lanes because they know they have Tahaka who has that great wave clear and can beat that. You're going to give up a little bit in terms of the ammo, maybe a little bit of structure. But look at this. The coordination to the double gravity lapse into the Anu Anubarak burrow is just so well executed there. They're going to get a Zul takedown and punish him for being that far out in the lane. Beautiful because most of them don't really have 
that that mobile skills that could actually, you know, save them whenever Mikhailson does these aggressive rotations. And if they get too extended into the lane, then there's no escape. It's them with a CC lock. Everything is there. The damage is there during the early game, and it's just Team Siri is going to be wary for these aggressive rotations. And again, they're going to enter the fight. Johanna, oh, right at the end of that nicely timed there, right at the end of the iron skin. I tell you what, these players, whenever they get a chance to be on stream, they just throw the sprays down. It's just like, <laughs> I know you don't do this in your normal games. I know this, you don't just do that when you're playing like scrims or whatever. But the minute you're on stream, these teams just keep throwing the sprays out. It adds to the, to the swag. <laughs> they finish off a kill. Anyway, here comes an aggressive rotation. There's the burrow. Skyblood, who is their target? Fiery Boy, one of the squishiest as well, and they are going to do it, but Team Sirius sees this coming. Fiery Boy so close to dying, but Vala is in trouble. He's just going to skadoodle out of there with Neon Faith doing a barrel roll. This is going to be an exchange as Sky T Blood will be the first one, last one rather, to retreat. But that's the thing. Despite the low health bars on the side of Mikhailson, it just seems like they're walking away still the winners of that fight. The threat is there. And again, Zul falls that Sylvanas in a team fighting situation, especially early game, before season marksman is stacked up. Before even 16 for Sylvanas, 13 for that double E ability to get those Qs out. Things like that. It just seems like they have such early game control if they want it. And right now they're continuing the follow-up, continuing to follow up that CC train. Just so well played, but I love the play from Johanna there. Good use of Iron Skin, good use of Condemn to get the zoning and keep Zul safe. Exactly. Team Sirius right now on the defense as they have, have to deal with these Spider Queens going to be sieging up to their own base. But Mikhailson rotating non-stop here, making the picks, making the plays. Team Sirius is just really forced to adjust to this kind of play style, which you have brought up earlier. The Sylvanas and the Zul cannot really have control if they keep doing this. It's almost impossible as we see, again, level seven is gonna help out tremendously for Sylvanas and for Falstad as we now see the Barb shot is here, helps on the queue, and then Boomerang here as well as Kagami, gotta be really careful, he's taking a lot of damage, but Uther has now joined the fight. Nice detainment strike onto that Zul who was looking to try and get a lock down there. We see the Condemn going in to try and start the fight, and they are on the back foot trying to walk away is Mikhailson. Uh-oh, Mikhailson just on the run, but still managed to get off a kill from that. Looks like Team Sirius is super aggressive at this point. Vala getting blind, but that's okay as it is a one-for-nothing exchange. Mikhailson wins that one. Kicking it old school with this Kel'thas build at level 7. Going into the Verdant Spheres, which you get the extra damage on your next auto attack. And that is a very, that is last year pre-talent <laughs> changes. I mean, there's a couple of options that we've seen, and that is not one that I have seen in over a year. Wow, Mikhailson on the KT. And they're just having a lot of control here for the whole map. <laughs> Team Serious. Whoops. I just hear the spray. <laughs> over and over and over again. They're just like, like there's like, I was here. And it's the same one every time. They're like, they like secretly, we're, we're obviously on a delay, but they secretly have like the stream up somewhere else. And they're like, are they talking about it? Yep, keep doing it. <laughs> 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 they're enjoying the spray attention. So meanwhile, looks like Team Sierra is going to be securing camps first to have more control over the lanes. But level 10, that's the only thing that they could do at this point, as it may be too risky to even start a fight since you know earlier from the first few minutes of the game they've been having trouble gaining control over the map as Mikhailson just keeps moving around one thing that's going to be really interesting because we see pyroblast picked up for Kael'thas not exactly uh, the most popular one but we are going to see it's in effect but it's going to require good coordination you either have to wait until divine shield is used or Anubarak is going to have to dive in use that cocoon on the Anubarak deny that from the enemy team and then try and get that Pyroblast onto a prime target before that Divine Shield can save them if it's potentially lethal. I can actually see that happening as Mikhailson is the type to actually bait out, make Team Serious chase and actually brave enough to wait for the cooldowns, brave enough to enter the fight again. As we've seen, Team Serious, sometimes they get a little bit too aggressive based from the first team fight that we saw and sometimes they get a little too close to the sun. 
I will say this, Kel'Thas has stayed alive, but he only has five stacks on his oh. convection. That's 15 away. I mean, obviously we're going to see more and more team fights as this game goes on, especially now that we're seeing another round of web weavers. Level 10 has now been picked up for series, so look for more opportunities to try and get that as we see the chase onto Dahaka. He's going to fly over. We should see a gust, but I'm not sure if he burrows. Oh, now he's just stuck there. Uh-oh, there's the gust. Nostalgia in the middle of it all. Will he be able to survive as Val is landing the auto attacks? Neon Faith still landing into damage, but it'll be too late. Dehaka falls. It feels like they're like, look, I think you're okay. We're just going to stay down here. <laughs> uh, we, I, all right, you're not as okay. All right, now, okay, yeah, we're going to be a little late. We'll get you next time, but we're going to go ahead and push in these bottom lanes. Thanks for taking one for the team. Exactly. Team Serious <laughs> right after that kill on towards the Dehaka. They're just going to be finishing off these web weavers, but, you know, at least they, they tried. That's that's the that's the point. <laughs> when it's at least we tried, then there you go. <laughs> but, I mean, you get pretty decent value out of that. I mean, you've opened up the, the map quite a bit. The, I like the rotations here. Is that They cleared up the bottom, forced it bottom, they rotated mid, leaving Team Sirius the last lane to defend that bottom lane and gives Mikhailson an opportunity to get some damage up top. They don't need to overstay their welcome here. They're getting some damage in. You can see they're trying to collapse, get that taken down, but softening this up is a win. Fall back, don't get caught in that. You have the potential fly into Gust again, but the fact that they're prioritizing a turn in over a defense there, I thought that was a good opportunity for them to take a team fight, but they're opting to play this objectively, get their first turn into the game. All right, Team Sirius adjusting. Instead of defending, they go for the turn in, summoning the Web Weavers. Let's see how they're gonna cap capitalize and get value out of this. As we've mentioned earlier, perhaps they're gonna be using the Zul, the Sylvanas, get more value out of those Web Weavers, and finally gain control of the lane. But, you know, McHaleson can definitely force fights Team Series are not prepared for. So Nostalgia just lurking around the corner. All right. They're going to go in. Uh, yeah, I mean, but the thing is, they're going to get a pick. But you're giving up this, you're get, lasting the full duration of this. And the pick is easy, but they're giving up a push with Sylvanas, which is instant clear. Yeah. And if you're on the side of Sirius, you got to think, all right, how far do we push this? Because your web weavers are cleared up in the other lanes. They've got to get out of here. Uh-oh, I can see a flank incoming. Looks like they decide to retreat, let the web weaver push Gust instead. is available. It is. But they're going in. Cocoon is not here. They get the stun, they get the follow-up, but you can see the return damage. And there's the Gust. Nice disengage, but they might not be done yet. They have nowhere to retreat to. But instead, it looks like Mikhailson going to drop back and defend against the Web Weaver. Things could have been a lot worse there for Sirius, but nice play there to hold on to that for Falstead. And the timing on it was very appropriate. Nicely done. Yeah, it's something C Team Sirius can play around with. They do have the disengage from the Mighty Gust. That's why they're most comfortable pushing in, extending onto that lane. But Web Weaver has been cleared. Let's see as Team Sirius has been more aggressive with their rotations, while Mikhailson will just keep chasing them down, cutting them off, and intercepting as Nikhil is just going to be lurking around the corner, corner while Dahaka is going to be on top. Kel'Thas still only has six stacks. Too We're 11 and a half minutes in. I mean, it's good because they're focused on the wave clear, but again, yeah. If you're focused on the wave clear, going to something else is we're going to see the bone prison on there. And the flame strike is going to go down there. Getting the stun, the silence there onto Anubrak who's trying to step on the point. I don't know if he has the burrow out. He's going to be in there. He is going to be the first to fall. But the fire is starting to spread around onto Fiery Boy. Heating up right now. That's going to be Uther falling as well. Sky T Blood in the Pyroblast. I don't think it's going to be enough. Oh, it is! It is. <laughs> oh. The shield, I think, just expired. Yeah, man, nicely done. Four for one exchange in favor of Mikhailson. Because of this, they can easily just push it out, but let's take a look at a replay and bring it down. I think the scary thing <laughs> about that was it's really weird because you get the shield on your barrel roll, but again, a new brat going in really deep. You can see the bone prison going in instantly. Kel'Thas just trying to zone it out. And again, just trying to get there. You see the Divine Shield on the backside? That's kind of the biggest thing is that Zul, super aggressive and contributes next to nothing outside of a, a golden man walking around. And look, oh. here's the barrel. The barrel roll is what you're going to see. Oh, and it, it expired. expired. You need to save your barrel roll because when you barrel roll, you get a shield. Yes. And if you save that for the moment or at least a little bit closer to detonation time, 
you give yourself that extra shield, and you probably could have lived. Exactly. That was actually pretty interesting to watch. But meanwhile, that's going to be another turn in for Mikhailson. That's a third Web Weaver summon, plus a pushed bottom as well. So earlier we saw in the team fight how Zula's trying his best to zone out the Vala and the Kael'thas, but because of the damage that they bring onto the table, it's just too overwhelming for him. Even though the Onubarak fell down, it was still enough for Mikhailson to bait out a lot of cooldowns and force Team Sirius to just retreat. Well, our Web Weavers will be pushing in here, and we're going to see the posture up in the middle lane. Look for them to try and get this and then move to the top lane. But they definitely want to start opening this up. With the keep wall down, this is prime opportunity to try and get the keep. Flame Strike on level 16 with a double Flame Strike. Really good at zoning. Really good at putting the pressure onto this. The keep, that Web Weaver is actually falling really quick. Indeed, as there are two more from bot and front. Let's see how Team Steer is going to be adjusting to this as Sky T Blood is going to be leading the front lines. Do they have enough to chase them down? Guess not. They'll decide to defend as this is their option. You can stay on this. I I'm actually surprised that they're giving that up because the Web Weavers do have to be responded to in top and bottom. And that just gives you the opportunity to go in, push that down, and take that keep. Instead, you can see that they're split. The indecision there is actually going to cost them. They're not going to be able to take down a keep. It's just going to allow Team Sirius more opportunities to stay in the game. Interesting choice from Mikhailson as they rotate. Four men at the top decide to retreat instead as Team Sirius responds to this. Meanwhile, camp has been taken from Mikhailson on the campsite of Team Sirius. So that is less control for them. They cannot start something definitely, not just yet, but two levels behind. The boss is their target. This is a risky play. A very risky play. Going up against a Kael Thos. Dahaka's going to do his best. You can see him on the mini-map. Kind of he's kind of the ward. He's trying to, be, uh, to block them out. Getting uh -oh. the dismount onto Johanna is a great start. We're going to look at this. The boss is down. It is going to be claimed. Nicely done there by Dahaka. Let's see if he's gonna, the sacrifice is going to be worth but looks like they're going to be going in. Niklaus actually burrows into the middle as Fiery Boy will zone out the two members from Mikhailson. The two carries, they're very low, but they got hope. They've got the support. Ariel, Fiery Boy will fall. And as you can see, Johan is on the run. With all the damage in the world, he's just going to fall down as well. Neon Faith chasing down the other member who's pretty low, and that's going to be <laughs> enough. <laughs> the explosive damage is just too much from the KT as Skyrar will fall. That'll be an ace. Oh, man. Pyro Blast. Just feel, feels dead, man. <laughs> feels bad. Oh, man. They should be able to push in here. You've got Vala. You've got Kel'Thas. This boss still pretty healthy. Ten more seconds for even Zul. Looks like Mikkelsen will move on. 15 kills to two. Kel'Thas only 15 stacks on that convection. It's okay. I Looks mean, like in the it. end, it works. In the <laughs> end, works. it works. Congratulations, that'll be 1-0 in our best of three series against Team Sirius. Mikkelsen, impressive showing against the Team Sirius. Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting to watch them early on because we saw the coordinated attack. The Anubrak and Kael'thas were very much in sync. They knew when to take their options, and every time that Zul or somebody would step out a little bit too far in that mid lane or where, wherever they would step out, they would punish them. And they had the team to do that when it came to the Anubrak Kael'thas. It's kind of the leading charge. You get the burrow charge in. You get the good gravity laps follow-up. And that's what you like to see from a team that's running a composition like that is do they have that synergy? And they obviously showed there in the early game and later in the game that they did have that synergy. I think there were a little bit of slip-ups at times, but for the most part, I actually really like their showing here in game one. Same here. I mean, with Mikhailson, the way that they drafted, they definitely know what their strengths were. Took advantage of Team Sirius hesitating a little bit or extending a little bit. They did not hesitate with their calls. They just went in through it. So that's why Mikhailson made their draft work. Team Sirius got a little bit too aggressive at times. Mikhailson managed to punish them whenever they chased too deep. And that's why I really love how Mikhailson drafted and performed during the first game. But, you know, first game... You know, it doesn't say much. It's, it says a lot about their synergy. But, you know, I remember that time where that was a seven-minute curse hall, and then the next game, it changed. So what's going to happen for Team Sirius during game number two? I think the, the more interesting thing that Sirius needs to look at as far as their approach to that is that 
When we saw the rotation to the bottom lane, Zul and Sylvanas or whoever was up in the top lane, they're like, oh, this is nice. We're getting really good wave clear, so we're going to push in. It's a really small battleground. And in theory, getting that maximum push and then trying to get greedy and get that early structure damage in, it sounds good in theory, but the minute you don't have that retreat option, that's one of the things that Zul lacks the most is he has zero retreat. He has zero retreat other than to walk away. He did go into the bone armor with the slow around it at level one. And so that works in a very small radius. So if you're trying to get people off of you, it doesn't it doesn't help when it's a Nubarak and a Kael'thas coming after you. So the way that they did it, it's like fool's gold, right? Like, man, this looks great. I can't believe I have all this. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, wait a minute, this isn't real. And now all of a sudden it's like a nightmare at that point. And you just got to understand, like, you know your limits. But if you extend beyond those, you're going to be punished. And that's the one thing that Mikkelsen did is that they punish them. It's not that serious, like... It's not that Sirius gave them those, but they <laughs> gave them those. And that's the thing is Mikhailson's like, thanks, we'll take this. Yeah, I understand what you mean, man. Because one thing I noticed, uh, pre-level 10, of course, there's not a lot of options for escape. Especially that most of the, the heroes that they picked were quite low mobility in terms of kit. So they were banking on the Mighty Gust for disengage whenever they want to do these aggressive pushes. But that's when they're all together. So, But when they're not together, it's just really Mikhailson capitalizing on those on those kind of strategies which worked out pretty well for them so i'm kind of curious what they're going to do in terms of adjustments when they come cursed hollows at, at a, in our second map yeah and this is again the the map where we saw uh them shine yesterday serious uh or actually was it serious it was resurgence resurgence okay Against but either way I, i'm trying to think of, of the games that we saw yesterday but yeah, it obviously brings a, an entirely different play style. I don't mind Sylvanas on this battleground. It's something that we see Dignitas run. They run like a Grey Man Sylvanas uh, strategy, things like that. You know, again, Sylvanas does the one thing that almost no other hero can do, and it's dictate rotations. Is that no matter how strong you think you are, if you give up a Sylvanas lane with a good comp behind it, you can just dictate the terms of the fight. And on that one, at times it did. I don't know if it's something that they just like to run or whether they just thought double specialist is the way to go on Tomb. And again, you have to know the limits and serious they're going to have to find their limits here in game number two else they're going to be done for the day because Mikhailson I think it was a final kill count of like 15 to 1 yeah. uh, in that game so obviously uh, they dominated basically every part of that they control the objective they control the team fighting they control the rotations with the picks that uh, they they managed to get so Sirius has a lot to make up for here in game number two Exactly. I mean, with Mikhailson showing earlier, they definitely knew what to do in certain situations. After pushing, I mean, you also suggested that perhaps they could have stayed in the mid lane to take advantage to make Team Sirius be torn of defending top and then bottom since the web weavers are still alive. But after that, they played it safe. They instead split up, decided to go boss, they and used the Dehaka as a ward, perhaps and as a blocking. And then after that, they still won the team fight after that. So it's pretty impressive. Like one after another, they know what to do. They're very quick in their decisions. Plus their team fighting is also very impressive. I like what I see so far. Again, we didn't get to see them yesterday. So uh, we do get to see them today uh, as we are just about ready for game number two to head into the draft and we'll be there momentarily. But again, Cursed Hollow brings a much different feel than Tomb of the Serenity. We go from one of the smallest battlegrounds to one of the biggest. And uh, again, the macro play that we'll see uh, coming out is, I saw Sirius yesterday. They went up against Deadly Kittens. It was rough. It was rough. Yeah, there's was. there's no hiding that. Deadly Kittens, really good team. Uh, makes you look makes you look bad sometimes. <laughs> but again, we didn't get to see Mikhailson yesterday. This is yes. our first look at them today. And uh, so far, I like what they see. Obviously, they went out in uh, the early part as we are ready for game number two here on Cursed Hollow. Here we go. Let's see what kind of strategies are going to be draft in here as Mikhailson actually banned the Genji and the Greymane during the first game. Meanwhile, Team Sirius took out the Stitches and Tassadar, but they really liked the Zul pick from yesterday, maybe because of Tomb of the Spider Queen, but they do like, you know, experimenting, obviously, taking risky drafts, trying to make them work. For Mikhailson this time around, they've been forming really solid drafts based on the first game, quite balanced as well, but they might take out the stitches as they're hovering over that. Teams are terrified <laughs> of this monstrosity known as stitches. I mean, I, I'm looking at him right there. That's... I mean, it's perfect because when you're going to be channeling uh, on towards the, uh, the curse, the tributes, then it's perfect. You just have to reel them in. How many beauty contests do you think he's won? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what? if it's a one-man beauty contest, then... He'll win for sure. 
<laughs> as long as he wears the uh, the summer outfit, you know, that's pretty. The summer, the bikini stitches. The bikini stitches. <laughs> All right, so first pick here. Because the way the Nubrek stands and where we see Uther, you know, Uther obviously is really strong. I wouldn't be surprised if it's an Uther, but I'd actually really like to see a Tahaka here. Get that global control. Get that map control. Obviously, we're switching sides here uh, with Sirius on the left, but I would not mind at all if we see an early Tahaka pickup to give yourself that advantage. Is that, And you have to understand what that advantage is. They do go with the Tahaka. And it's that if you find yourself down, if you find yourself unable to contest, if you find yourself you lost a pick, you can still mitigate a lot of that damage that you're going to lose elsewhere by getting that Tahaka, getting that global control, and getting that soak. Exactly. Plus the potential pickoff uh, we've seen it from Mikhailson pairing it with the Anubarak CC lock for days. So it's something that they could take advantage of. Get a pick to an objective, something that they uh, Mikhailson has done from the earlier stages of the first game. So we'll see what Mikhailson replies with their two picks here. Uh, what do you think? I mean, they love the Oriel, they love the Vala. If you're going Vala, yep. I was going to say just lock the Oriel. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> it's way too tempting. To, to give up, but if this is not a Nubarak Uther or Greymane Uther, and if this is not just somehow Uther in this rotation, then it shows that you're not comfortable on that hero. I, I think that there's a lot of really good supports out there, but right now, the way that this is uh, playing out, getting that Greymane Uther in this slot would be amazing. It gives you good poke, it gives you good sustain, and it gives you just basically all around team fighting potential that you know that you're going to need. And so... Right now, they're debating, unless they want to make it weird again. <laughs> I have a feeling that they're going to make it weird a little bit with a Falstad. They really like the Falstad pick for this one. Double globals. Falstad is, is an interesting thing, because I actually saw it played earlier. Gale Force played this during the North American HGC a little while ago, and I was watching it play it. And we haven't seen a lot of Falstad. He still has a global. He still has good boss control. He still has good disengage because of the Mighty Gust, things like that. But... Team fighting potential is limited. So you have to find opportunities of, do you get the gust in? Do you find ways to isolate a hero? Things like that. And again, it's something that if you can force out Crystal Aegis, you gust them away. And then the Aegis target is now stuck there, isolated by themselves. So you can find ways to follow up. But it, I wonder, does Sirius have that mentality on how to do that? Do they have the mentality to take advantage of the double global? The double global is something that if you manipulate appropriately, it is absolutely terrifying. So it's, it's a lot of question marks I have right now for series. We'll see, though. I mean, it's something that they're, just as you mentioned, comfortable with. Mikhailson is definitely playing their draft in a way that they're just going to be taking everything that they need. Meanwhile, for Team Series, same goes for them. So double globals, as you mentioned, they're going to be banning the same thing at the second rotation. Cassiter and Greymane, both of them have banned these... Uh, earlier at the first game, but they're going to be going for the Anubarak for that CC. Impale and Cocoon. You want to know a fun play that I want to see? What's up? Nubrak's unstoppable when he's using his Burrow Charge. The minute he hits E, just press R as Falstad, and now who's there with a Nubrak? Nobody. No one. It's just something fun you can do. Small small <laughs> things that you can do to try and mess with uh, other teams and isolate that hero and blow him up. Again, his health pool is not that high. And if you have the auto attack damage from Falstad, you get a little bit of burst damage in. You get the, the appropriate follow-up to stun the tongue. Uh, Nubrak, again, it's not something we see that often, but it could be a little fun. We'll see. I mean, Anubarak versus Tahaka. Karazim for the secondary support. Interesting. It's, we haven't seen Karazim in a while in the SEA. Day one, we didn't see him at all. It was more like Brightwing, Regar, the standard Oriel. So we'll see, though. Mikhailson. I'm taking Arthas all day here. Physical armor on his base kit. Good survivability, good contention around shrines, good survivability. Going up against the Vala double support comp, Karazim's going to be auto-attacking. Vala's going to be auto-attacking. I mean, that's where a lot of your frontline control lies right now. It does really good to Anubarak. If Anubarak burrow charges in, his only escape is walking out. There's the Arthas. I love it. Nicely done by Team Sirius. Definitely denying any sort of aggression. Just with a little bit of hauling blast, and it's going to be them in terms of denial, but we'll see what they're going to be picking last as they will be securing their... What do they need? What else do they need? They need more damage. They need more damage. I, and this needs to be... I'd love a Li Ming here. Just, Li Ming. They go Gul'dan. Interesting. Hmm. 
So the one thing that Gul'dan does against an Anubarak, so this is why it's not the worst pick. I mean, obviously, so you can life you can life drain off of beetles. That's a small thing. But the weird thing is, is that if Anubarak goes on to a Gul'dan, does he have the appropriate follow-up? Does he have the team to dive with him? So that's why I think right now, like, I'd actually like to see another melee-style hero, maybe another warrior to try and supplement that. But Gul'dan has sustained damage against the Anubarak. Yes, Anubarak has base spell armor, but his Nerubian armor at level 1 is now at procs every 12 seconds. Yes, it lasts for a few seconds. But Gul'dan, with his consistent poke there, actually does really well against that. It's not the best. Again, Li Ming, I think, would do good to pop the cocoon, do really well to contest the tribute. Li Ming has some of the best tribute contention when it comes to ranged mages, more so than Gul'dan. Gul'dan becomes a little bit more susceptible. Oh, my. Lost Vikings for the last pick for McKelson. So we were expecting something cheesy on you know, Team Sirius, maybe a little bit weird, but it turns out Team Sirius is really brave with this Lost Vikings pick. So, Lost Vikings is weird for two reasons. I, I like it because it's Cursed Hollow, you can get good control over that. But it's kind of, you fall into the same trap of, all right, we don't have that body that's going to be there at the tribute early on. It's normally, you get played again, something like that at level 10. But you're going up against double global false that to Haka. The one thing that the Lost Vikings struggles with is when you get picked. If one of the Vikings gets picked, you now have to either go to that lane and or you lose Soak. When it comes to the fact that you have Falstad and Tahaka, both of them have kill potential. Falstad has a lot more kill potential on the Vikings than Tahaka does, but you can still rotate one of those in and push that over. And so that's a little bit surprising to me that we're going to see Vikings. It's not the worst map. It's not the worst call. And if you're a good Vikings player, then you're going to make people look silly. So... Our first Vikings here, I'm looking forward to it. Same here as we head on to our game number two between Team Sirius versus Mikhailson. Wow. Not only are we seeing Q build, or not, we are not seeing Q build Gul'dan, we're seeing Corruption build. Corruption build, build. so definitely more control and more painful whenever they are going to be trying to contest tributes here i just gul'dan over leaving and lost vikings against double global it's not the worst thing i mean when the tribute fight breaks out and you have vikings just splitting all lands that's one way to get advantage but if tahaka and falstad both say look call us when you need us else just sit there and contest we're going to try and do this try and win that fight one only one of them has to come in and then the minute you can want to get both of them in, you used... So one of the best ways to do it is to fly false that in first if you need that contention over the tribute. That way you have a four on four. And then you can, don't necessarily give up too much on the soak. The minute you want to fight, and this is one of the best ways to do it, especially early game, you wait for Dahaka. You wait, you leave Dahaka in the lane, you wait for Dahaka, and then you just kind of brush Stalker in behind and then force a team fight. And then you have the advantage. And that's kind of the thing is that you get the advantage of the Dahaka flank. And then you can turn a 4v4, 3v4 into a 4v4 when Falstead flies in. You wait a little bit, and then you get Dahaka in there, you force the team fight, and it gives you that early game advantage. If you get those picks around the tributes, then you can kind of use that. Your globals weren't wasted. You get the picks. But if you use that, you don't get the picks and you waste your globals, and then maybe you get the tribute, maybe you don't. But if you end up trading zero kills to zero kills and everybody just walks away, the Vikings went out in that. So you kind of have to look for opportunities. You don't necessarily have to get the tributes early, but it's one of those things that if you're going to play it appropriately, you got to use it to get picks either on the Vikings or you got to use it picks to get it on the tribute. And you got to find ways to work around that. So strategically, those are the ways that if you're going to play globals against Vikings, if you're going to play Vikings against double global, <laughs> both teams have to be very careful in how they, they balance that out and knowing when to give up. When to give up an objective is kind of the key here, especially if you're on the side of the Vikings team. Now that you bring that up, I'm kind of questioning what kind of options in terms of disengage does Team uh, McKailson have? Because you mentioned if they get to walk away, but what are the options in terms of, air quote, walking away do they have? It seems that if they get caught out, it's just basically kind of difficult for them to get out in a sticky situation. I mean, there's a Kill lot them. of ceases. Kill them. <laughs> Kill them. Yeah, Kill that, them. that's your form of walking. I mean, obviously, Ariel is going to be supplemented a lot there with Vala, so it does really good to keep those AoE heals available. You know, early tributes are going to be much easier because you have that way to walk back, get close to, you know, the, the different turn-ins. That's why I say, like, if you get to – so the first three – 
tributes spawn in phases of three. You can kind of predict the third one, things like that. And so understanding that if it's going to be on the enemy team side, do you really need to contest that? Because you don't necessarily have that hard disengage option. You obviously are going to have an Uberac there to try and disrupt a lot of things. If you need to sacrifice somebody, that's there. You have detainment strength to push maybe an individual player back, things like that. So again, it's a matter, it's not so much of do they have the right disengage. It's a matter of will the Dahaka player be using the appropriate flanks? Again, there's so many small things. I mean, I wish you could just break this down because <laughs> Curse Hollow is, is such a, a diverse map yes. in the way that it has to be played. And then if you can predict where the next tribute is going to be, how can you manipulate the camps? How can you manipulate manipulate the globals, your flanks, things like that? So there's really a lot of – when you play double global, you can talk about this all day. I don't want yeah. to because um, <laughs> we're trying to get back into the game right now. But um, that's the whole thing is that when you see it, you'll know it. And, uh, you know, we'll call it out if the Falstad plays it appropriately, if the Dahaka comes in with the flanks appropriately. We'll see it. We'll call it out. And that's kind of the thing is that playing those, it's not do you play it well individually. It's do you play it well as a team. Exactly. Because for me, looking at the draft from Team Sirius, I feel like it's going to be quite the opposite in comparison to the first game that we mentioned where Team McHaleson was the one who has been dictating the pace of the game. Meanwhile, I feel like this time around it could be Team Sirius who would be doing that. What do you think? I'm, I was trying to get an update. We were going to do what? Oh, what? what I, I, was, I was trying to check on the update over here. So what was the question? Oh, the question was because uh, during the, er the first game, right, it was Team Sirius, oh uh, no, it was Team McHaleson that was dictating the pace of the game. And it was Team Sirius just following them all over the map. But meanwhile, I feel like the draft from Team Sirius is just going to be the opposite. They're the ones who's going to be making the plays, playing the music, and Mikhailson probably might have to dance. And it's weird because, again, if you can use Falstad to fly in or send somebody down to fly in, just getting one Vikings pick, because you imagine it's going to be Vikings split out, and then you're going to have your four-man rotation. And so how do you respond to that rotation? If you are forcing your global, let's say they use their four-man to go to the bottom, you've got Falstad bottom, Dahaka in the top lane, and the four-man goes bottom, and you feel it necessary to bring Dahaka bottom, then you're probably going to lose out on that unless you get a pick. So... The four-man can dictate the rotations, but the rotations have to be responded to appropriately. You have to leave one of the globals in one of the top or bottom lanes, or both of them, essentially, and then respond accordingly with the other. If you need to rotate up, make sure it's a slow rotation. Don't waste your globals. You know, they're on a long cool. I think Daga's Brush Talker just got nerfed again to where it's now 60 seconds. So you have to also keep in mind that if it's before the first tribute phase, when do you do that? Keep an eye on the clock of when that tribute spawns. After it's captured, there's a window on when it will go. So you don't necessarily want to brush stalker away instantly. If you do, you want to make sure it's on cooldown. So timing that appropriately. If you don't time those appropriately, then yeah, the team with the Vikings can definitely control that. But if you know when and where to use it and you're more reserved, then the global should be able to control it. Kind of reminds me of the first game where uh, the Dehaka from the first game actually used the brush stalker early. Just a scout. Yeah. And yeah. then it's like, well, I'm going to go up here. And then it ended up getting really split because the solo lane ended up somehow being on the top lane. Uh, as we are headed back into the game, I know you guys are ready for that. Uh, we have a quick, uh, slight mix up there. And we're going to head right back into the game here at Curse Hollow. Game two with Mikhailson up 1 0. Yep, Siri. 1 0. Again, this is a best of three series. I kind of wonder if Team Sirius has adjusted or fixed a couple of things coming from the first game, learned a lot of things from that one. But yes, we'll head on to Cursed Hollow. Again, the, the one thing that I talked about is the fact that we're seeing Corruption build for Gul'dan. So stacking that up. You know, I look at that in the sense that if the Vikings are nearby, then sure, you should be able to get easy stacks. But going up against an Anubarak and a Karazim, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to probably get the stacks that you're hoping for. So we'll see exactly how this Gul'dan build plays out as time goes on. All right, let's check out the rotations here uh, during the initial point of the game. And the, with the corruption build that you've been talking about, most likely it'll be very effective once, you know, that stacks come in, get the quest in, plus during tribute phases where people are channeling, it'll definitely have more zone control. And Mikhailson definitely has to respect that once that's in, but here comes the early rotation. All right, here we go. You can see on the mini-map that Team Sirius recognized they needed to kind of play between lanes and be able to get there at some point. You give up one tower, which isn't the biggest of deals. As uh, that That's not a good sign for the Vikings player at the beginning of the game. Exactly. That was what you mentioned earlier. Once they get caught out, then it's something that Team Sirius can keep capitalizing on. 
But, you know, it is just the first few minutes of the game, and definitely something Mikhailson should watch out for. Uh oh, again, another pickoff on towards the top side of the map. Falstad easily kills another Viking. I mean, the number one way to deal with Vikings is to get a pick. And look at this. So now you have no response stop. The Viking is going to be slow to rotate. You're going to give out on experience. And that's how, if you're playing Vikings, generally you think, all right, we've got Vikings. We should have an experience advantage. Going up against double global, not so much. But every ounce of experience you lose, is just, it will accumulate over time. And one minute you'll be looking at even 2-2. Two, two, and the next thing you know, you're looking at 7 versus 6 on a tribute. Uh-oh, they are focusing on the Vala, who's super low at the moment. Look at those GOT damage. Is it going to be enough? Yes, it will. Vala falls. That'll be the third kill for Team Sirius, as they are going to be continuing with the pressure. Mikhailson, too aggressive. I mean, so you have your Vikings, so then you're thinking, all right, I've got this four-man comp. I can just push in any lane, but I just... Over aggression, understanding your limits, and they're they're pushing a little bit too hard right now. Exactly, and Team Sirius definitely their composition is the right form to actually punish those kinds of plays. So Mikhailson maybe should step back a little bit as they've been mo ha have been given away like three kills already in the past few minutes as the first tribute will spawn at the top side of the map. One thing that's interesting because we're seeing tissue regeneration, so you get the extra essence, right? You get the extra essence from the globes. So we're going to see the continued push here, but it permanently increases the health regen up to 40 and essence up to up by 10, up to 60, right? And so I wonder if at 13 we'll see the vulnerability or the auto attack damage. And here is a full push there with Siege Giants and giving up that. Remember when I talked about understanding when and where to use your globals and when to contest the tributes? Yes. That just happened. And so they assumed that they needed to go one place. And Mikhailson's like, we don't have to. And they understand that we have this composition. You're, you can afford to give up early tributes. If I'm saying that I'm giving up one tribute to take an entire fort and get damage on a keep wall, I am very happy with the first three minutes of the game. Definitely, that was pretty worth. It is just too early to the game. It's okay to give out a tribute. As Haka, Fiery Boy might be a little too deep into this, but it looks like they're going to be breaking the tower there, and the wall is definitely not going to be healthy. Mikhailson with a camp still pretty healthy, as Team Sirius just really wants to start something. Falstad, very low barrel wall. Shield close to death. He's safe, but Skyrar with the last auto. Ooh. Our Vala player, whose name I don't know, <laughs> is just doing so. Look at the look at the positioning. Just 100% confidence that your Ariel is gonna back you up. There's the detainment strike. They're going in. Nice burrow in there as Kerzim goes in. We're gonna see the follow up, and all of a sudden we're looking at a four minute keep here as we see the tribute on the backside was picked up by the Vikings player, and there is just no response to this team. This is why Gul'dan. And Falstad are just really tricky heroes to play against this comp that is absolutely sieging. Uh-oh, nicely done with a heal as well from the Oriole. I thought that Vala was done for. But can you imagine? They've been pushing a lot, still soaking up experience. Second tribute is going to be spawning in favor of Team Sirius's position. But that's a Viking getting picked off by Fiery Boo. But still, they got a lot from that. Not swift enough, Eric. <laughs> All right, we have a full level lead here in favor of Mikhailson, who are just getting all kinds of cheeky in here. I am absolutely loving this. If This is something that I love to do. When I play with friends and, and stuff like that, I love to just be like, look, let's break from the tradition. Let's break from the norm. Because right now, you have serious. You talked about making a team dance. They're making them dance all <laughs> over the place. That keep at the bottom is now going to be threatened. We're talking about a boss. It's only five minutes in. That boss doesn't do much damage. But what it does is it gives you control. We're talking about level 10 coming up here in a minute. We're talking about level 10, potentially another boss. But they're going to go around. They're going to try and guarantee this keep just about six minutes in the game. And these are things that you can do against your opponent. Not only that, I think they think that their confidence is going to end because they're not yet 10. I'm surprised they're not trying to just get a pick. This isn't going to get the keep, I don't think. 
Looks like they're just gonna be settling with a lot of camps, keep pressuring them as they have lane control advantage, and just let the boss die out. I am so surprised, Riku. You you have ten advantage. You have ten. You walk up and you dare them to try and push out two feet. You take the keep and you walk away. All right. So Mikaelson, for what it's worth, is still controlling this pretty handedly. Wow, fiery boy, just gonna be stalking oh. the hidden Viking as he gets a camp. Play it again. Oh, he gets out so safely. How sneaky is that? Okay, Mikaelson here. In the mid lane, the Howling Blast is going to be locking everybody else. Nikhil's B5 is going to be running safely, safe and sound, as Vala with a dash in. Skyar landing, are going to be retreating rather, as the Impale reaches Kogami. That's going to be okay. Level 11, still no level 10, but they're taking tributes as well. You know, there's still a lot of hope, though, for Sirius, is that, you know, level 10 right around the corner, you know, they can get a gust into a fly, into a potential. Dare I say at this point, if you get the fly into the Divine Storm, that might be worth considering. I think Divine Shield will probably still be more likely. But you've got the Horrify, you've got the Gush, you've got things like that. And then you've got the full AoE abilities of Arthas and Dahaka. So not all is just lost yet. We've seen uh, almost a keep down, should have been a keep down. We've seen the boss taken from you. We've seen two forts down, and your response has been next to nothing. But you're level 10 now. And we see Divine Storm was considered. Uh -oh. But this is a moment for Team Sirius to start to turn this around. Exactly. Level 10, this is their opportunity as another tribute has spawned. Viking will fall with Vala just being aggressive here. Going to be mounting up and level 12 already for Mikaelson. But it's going to be a race because whoever gets this gets the curse. You're right back in the game. You're going to get a curse. I'm, the boss call is a little bit of a late start. But you're going to get a curse. You find yourself back into the game. They definitely have to respond to the bottom, though, because uh, Viking plus Siege Camp. Yeah. Nicely done there. Nicely done indeed, as Team Sirius is definitely, as you mentioned, back in the game. They're going to be taking the boss as a response. Back to pressure the top side of the map as a sort of form defense. But Dehaka will be staying at the bot side. Meanwhile, you can tell Mikaelson is just playing this so safely. I mean, you you mentioned they were level 10. They could have just marched into their base, but they didn't. 10-8 plus catapults plus Vikings. The thing that we're going to see from Vikings is that late game, the way that you push out, we already saw a good use of plate again. You, you push out a little bit further, you go, as we see Arthas uh, is going to get caught out here. The detainment strike in. Army is out. Divine Shield has to be used, but the Horrify is out right now. The stun, the lockdown onto Anubrak is going to get the kill. Kerazim goes seven-sided strike in full defense mode, and now they are running back, but the Howling Blast is going to land, Riku. Mikaelson is on the run. Mighty Gust being used just to stop the retreat, and look at that. That's going to be the Aria using the Aegis onto herself, but that be, will be no good as two members fall from Mikaelson. My god. Just like I'm telling you, the minute level 10 hits, this game is a completely different story. The fact that we don't have catapults in response, you know, I talk about that pushing out. It's just a matter of getting control, forcing rotations out, finding advantages. Now that you don't have that keep, it's going to be much harder to get that, especially because, you're, again, you're going against the double globals. You don't have that 10 advantage. So not getting that keep could come back to hurt them in the long run. So it's a really weird spot, but Sirius has found their way back. They're going to get played again. Not going to be in time, but right, we'll get it. There, but <laughs> the whole thing is that level 10 hit, and you didn't take advantage of your level 10. And that is oftentimes a pretty damning moment in a game that if you don't take advantage of that and you're in a, the opponent has that many game-changing heroics between Horrify, between Mighty Gust, then things could potentially get bad. And right now, it's getting a little bit bad for McKillson. Exactly. Mikhailson had that chance to actually congest or restrict the area of Team Sirius and just keep pressuring them and not soak the lane. So it was definitely an opportunity Mikhailson could have took. But you know what? It's still a very exciting match for this. Whenever they enter into these team fights, it was just the first curse. But looks like Mikhailson is going to be playing this safe. But it's really a little, looking a little bit scary for Mikaelson. I mean, they get this next tribute here, and the game just turns right back around in favor of Mikaelson. So the 
The burden is going to be here on Sirius to continue to keep the pressure up, to continue to try and get picks. All they need is one pick to continue to try and control the battleground as all of our players just aren't just like... There we go. But the Howling Blast, the vulnerability is in. There's the Horrify. They're going to isolate, stun, lock down Karazim. And they are not done yet as the Cocoon is in response to try and buy a little bit of time. It did just that. And that's what I'm talking about. Keep the pressure on. Finding opportunities. They sat in that bush. They had the party bush available. They got the gank. And just like that, they're continuing to keep the pressure on, not allowing the team of Mikhailson to reestablish themselves. But will you look at that? 16 seconds on the clock. Harrison is about to respawn in a while, but that's going to be the key for Mikhailson to get back in the game. I wonder if they can stall as long as they can, but it's a real, really too risky with the corruption plus Mighty Gust. Vala is definitely should really be careful with this as Ice Frog is channeling nice oh and pale. My. Uh, Perfectly done there. And if you're on the side of Sirius, you could have taken Boss to negate a lot of that, but instead they opted to get there. They got there a little bit late. They're going to find themselves a Viking uh, as Eric just like, Wee. Wee. I'm gonna Oh, <laughs> the Jukes. He's just playing the around hammering. now. That's, that's actually really good value because he just damaged the, the minion wave, got a full lane soak. That, and the fact that he gets away. Exactly. Mikhailson's top lane would definitely have a party over there. As Mikhailson, well, look at that. They're going to be settling with the boss, and that's going to be really painful for Team Sirius as they have invested their time on killing that Viking. We'll see if they're going to be making it in time. Mighty Gust will be too late. Woo. Wow. Wow. Just... Clutch. Very clutch. So close every time. We're going to look at a much stronger boss here. And if they don't complete this, I'd be surprised. Gul'dan, just about 30 seconds ago, did complete his level 1 talent. So now when he puts that E out, it's going to also return, doing just that significantly more damage. The Horrify is going to be there a little bit early. Yes, Cocoon. No follow-up. Exactly. As Arthur is going to be released from his Cocoon. Ball is going to be landing all of the autos as well as Falstead and the rest of the members. Nine detainment, detainment strike over to the Arthas. That's going to be the Divine Shield just saving him as Mikhailson will be continuing with a push with a half health boss there. And the rest are still pushing with a cap still alive at the top side of the map. Gul'dan needed to put pressure onto the boss. Instead, he's still trying to look to team fight behind that. They're going to have to dodge the root. The shields are starting to fall. They should still be able to defend this, but Mikhailson recognizes they overstayed their welcome a little bit. The shields fell, but the core still at 100% health. And now they are retreating. We still have a gust available. I don't know if he has flight. He, yeah, that we, we will see, but then Mikhailson actually decides to play it safe let's go retreat we've taken enough it's fine we can fight another day as they are two levels ahead and meanwhile they're going to be doing a reset as zero curse tributes rather has been taken let's see if team Sirius is going to be continuing with this chase they want to make a pick here well they look to be going for the boss they're gonna set up a little bit of a flank there dahaka starting to come in but they don't have an opportunity dahaka does get the tongue the vulnerability is there but no follow-up but now the gold in the corruption is going out the stun the lockdown seven sided strike used in defense there to try and get out he's able to dash away but now we see a nubarak in response going in on the backside sky t blood is going in but first of all will be dahaka Beautiful detainment strike as well, just to counter the Arthas. So you don't, you're not going to be bothering the Vala. But there you go, Mighty Gust for disengage. <laughs> They're done. They're not going to contest the boss anymore. They're My done. favorite part about that was the minute I saw that Gust and I saw that entire team, I'm like, they're going straight to the boss. And I was like, that's one really quick way to get there. <laughs> exactly. It's like a, uh, an assist. But anyway, 50 seconds on the Viking timer here. And that's going to be fine. They're fine. Ooh. They are prioritizing a Viking kill over getting the Giants. That is a mistake. So the Giants actually help defend pretty well. It buys time. It gives you a little bit of defense there. They had enough time to get that. Instead, they prioritized the kill, which I'm not a big fan of. We do see the big, big damage going out there. Arthas just barely able to walk away. But now their only defense is themselves. And this keep is open and exposed to be taken down especially that the Vikings are just going to be taking in that tribute. But look at that. There's the CC lock on towards the Arthas. It's pretty low, plus blinded. Cocoon as well being used by the Anubarak as Fiery Boy will try to break Skyroar out of that. But the boss is still a big threat 
for Team Sirius. There's the Gust. Stay away from our base, but that won't stop them. Season Marksman was finished, so Falstad has a little bit more team fighting potential. Tunneling Claws forced to be used to get away from that boss, but they are continuing the follow-up as Karazim is going in, and he's going hard right now, and he is firing those fists off a million miles a minute. <laughs> Interesting. For Vala, Reign of Vengeance earlier at the Clutch Divine Shield, but that won't help. Here, the Taco Fall followed by Skyrar, and that is it. My god, Mikhailson, well played. Heals are keep coming in from Ice Frog, but 2 and 0 against Team Sirius. Mikhailson, impressive showing. Definitely not an easy second game, but they made it work. I mean, they had amazing control early game. They gave up a little bit, but you got to credit Sirius for turning things around again. The minute they hit 10, they decided they're going to turn things around. They had heroics that were, they were able to play around, things like that. But again, it just seems like the better team won there. And I, you got to give credit to Mikhailson recognizing their opportunities. Again, I thought they were a little bit hesitant when they had 10 advantage down there. I think they could have probably had a much more dominant, better game uh, had they just postured up a little bit to take that keep. Uh, but instead, they wanted to play it safe. And in the end, they got it. But uh, again, we see a lot of promise out of this team. They recognize their composition. They recognize their opponent's flaws. And they were they were able to exploit that. So uh, really well done there by Mikhailson to move on. Exactly. I'm really impressed about how they played out that game. It seems like they have a lot of tricks up their sleeves. Plus, they're confident enough to be drafting these sorts of play styles. And I'm really looking forward to seeing them more. But you know what? We're going to be seeing more games, Jay How as we're going to be Heading on to a short break before we proceed to our second game, but it'll be Fighting Doji's versus Resurgence. Yeah, that's something we expect uh, to see a lot out of Resurgence, but as you said, we're going to hit that short break, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in just a moment. See you soon.